Okay. Hello? I don't see the on the air yet. Ah, perfect. Good evening and welcome to the January 7th Town Council meeting. Deputy Mayor, would you lead us in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you. Would the town clerk please take attendance? Councillor Breton? Here. Councillor Forrest? Here. Councillor Hurley? Here. Councillor Latina? Here. Councillor Lesser? Here. Councillor Rell? Here. Councillor Spinella? Here. Deputy Mayor Martino? Here. And Mayor Morin Bello? Here. Thank, Thank you, you, Dolores. <clears throat> our, first, um, our first piece of business is a presentation by the, um, our auditors for our town audit report. This is the first time we're doing it at a council meeting because we've changed our format. We no longer have a budget and finance committee per se, so we have a budget workshop. So welcome and thank you for being here. Can, is this on? Can you hear me? Yes, make yes. sure you talk into it because it is. Okay. Uh, we do want to pick up. Okay, so uh, good evening everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, so I think in front of you, you have the 2018 CAFR federal single audit, state single audit, um, required auditors communication and management letter. And it's my understanding that you're just seeing this tonight for the first time, so yes. you probably won't have any in-depth detailed questions. Um, I'm gonna you know, give a presentation kind of a treetop level. I've also put that in your um, area, it's just a PowerPoint presentation. If you do have questions during my presentation, just interrupt me. And um, if you have questions after the presentation, please reach out to me. Okay? Great. Thank you. Okay. Would you just identify yourself, Vanessa? Uh, Vanessa Rosito. I'm the engagement partner for the Town of Weathersfield Audit from Bloom Shapiro. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And also with me is Jess Anaskoff, who's the manager, and Angela Lombardo, who is the senior on the engagement. Okay. So... As far as the agenda tonight, I'm gonna to talk about the engagement scope and the standards that we follow. I'm going to summarize the required auditor's communication, and then I'm gonna go over some of the highlights of the CAFR, the federal and state single audit, the management letter, and then also just let you know about the GASB pronouncements that are upcoming in the next three years. Okay, so as far as the CAFR, we uh, issue an opinion on the governmental activities, each major fund, and the aggregate remaining fund information. Um, under standards, uh, auditing standards ge generally accepted in the United States of America, and also standards applicable to financial audits contained in government auditing standards issued by the Comptroller General of the United States. Uh, we perform a federal single audit in accordance with uh, US OMB uniform guidance, and then the state single audit is performed under the State Single Audit Act, and the references are there for the general statutes. For the required auditor's communication, all of your significant accounting policies are listed in note one to the CAFR. Um, there were two new standards adopted during this year's audit, GASB 75, which is accounting and financial reporting for other post-employment benefits, and also GASB 85, which is Omnibus 2017. So I'll go over this a little bit more, but um, GASB 75, if you remember from last year, we adopted GASB 74, so there, were new, there was new disclosure in the financial statements. There was a new way to measure the OPEB liability, and just the disclosure had changed. So this year, we took the new OPEB liability, recorded that in your financial statements, and took the old liability off. So I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more. And then GASB 85 was just terminology changes, really not a big effect on your financial statements. Um, there are accounting estimates in your financial statements, just like in most municipal financial statements. Um, they're listed on, this, on page four of the presentation. 
uh, your net pension liability and your net OPEB liability. You utilize an actuary to estimate those amounts for you based upon management's assumptions. Um, useful life of capital assets, which is used to uh, calculate the depreciation. Those are in line with industry standards. Uh, the allowance for doubtful accounts on your taxes receivable. The claims incurred but not reported for medical and dental uh, claims. And also your heart and hypertension liabilities. Those are all based on historic information. We did not encounter any difficulties performing the audit. We did not have any disagreements with management. There are no uncorrected misstatements in the audit. Uh, management did not consult with another auditing firm for like a second opinion. Um, and we do request that management signs a representation letter. So both the town and the Board of Ed uh, management signed a representation letter stating that Everything that we ask them, they have answered truthfully, and everything that we've asked to see, they've given us, basically. As far as the engagement results, um, so for the CAFR, we've issued an unmodified or a clean opinion on the various opinion units, which is the highest form of an opinion that you can receive, and you know, you're used to getting that kind of opinion. Um, as far as the responsibilities of the CAFR, uh, management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of the financial statements and also for the de design, implementation, and maintenance of internal control so that financial statements are free from material misstatement, whether due to error or fraud. Uh, so our responsibilities are to express opinions on the financial statements and also to plan and perform our audit to provide reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free of material misstatement. And then just some um, information treetop level for some of the results of the various funds of the town. On a government-wide basis, your net position remained pretty consistent. Um, it decreased slightly. Uh, it was 85.207 million in 18 and 84.901 million in 17. Um, some of the changes, if you will, in the government wide uh, numbers capital assets were pretty consistent at 175 million. Debt decreased 15 million as a result of the decrease in your OPEB liability, which is a, a good thing. Um, and then there was another liability that did increase. Um, it's called deferred outflows of resources. Um, so that increased 15 million. Um, so, so what happens, rather than all the changes in your OPEB liability being um, recorded in expense during the year, some of it gets recorded in liabilities and amortized over you know, three or four or five or six years. So that liability did increase the 15 million. Your general fund fund balance uh, was 12.46 million, which is an increase of 345,000 from 2017. Uh, your unassigned fund balance increased 168,000, um, and that is 11.5% of your general fund expenditures. For the general fund, budgetary revenues came in 591,000, less than budget, and budgetary expenditures came in 833,000, less than budget. So while the budgetary revenues came in less, the expenditures came in more than the revenues came in less. So you did a good job of keeping expenditures down because the revenues were down. Tax collections on the current grand list year were 99.13%. The other governmental funds of the town fund balance increased 418,000. Uh, your two internal service funds, heart and hypertension, net position decreased 61,000. Ending net position was 410,000. And then hospital and medical insurance insurance net position decreased 642,000 um, ending net position in that fund was 3.854 million. Um, I believe in both of these funds the claims expense was more than it was in the in previous years. 
Your two fiduciary funds, pension trust fund net position increased 5.345 million. Ending net position in that fund was 97.223 million. And then in your OPEB trust fund, net position increased 1.929 million. Ending net position was 16.557 million. So these are the two funds where you um, contribute assets to pay for these liabilities. Um, the positive net position in these funds were because of the good market conditions last year. So hopefully we'll have the same thing next June 30th. We'll see. Um, does anybody have any questions on any of those funds? Go ahead, Councilor Forrest. Thank you, Mayor. Specifically on those two funds, the trust fund and the pension fund, yep. do we, uh, uh, um, how do we invest those particular assets? So if you look uh, in the CAFR, um, there is actually an asset allocation schedule for those monies. So on page 54, you'll see the, the target allocation for the pension fund. And then on page 55, you um, will also see the long-term expected real rate of return for those categories. So for pension, 5% um, is in cash, 27.5 is in core fixed income, 37.5 large cap U.S. equities, 5% in small cap U.S. equities, 20% in developed foreign equities, and then 5% in emerging market equities. And is that a determination made by our finance department or someone else? So that's a committee. Pension committee. Pension, oh, pension committee. Pension committee makes that determination. Mm -hmm. And then similarly for the OPEB fund, um, on page 63, you could see that target allocation and also the long-term expected, expected real rate of return for those. What was that page? Oh, sorry, 63. Uh, 63. And is that also, also true related to the fund balance and its investments? Is that, I'm sorry? Is the same process used for the fund balance and its investments? So the investments are an asset in the fund. So when the fund balance increases, it's a result of the, the increase in the investment value, if you will. I'm not talking about the trust, though. I'm talking about the fund balance of the town, the 12 and a half million. Oh. How is that, how, is, how do we derive revenue from those assets? The, for the general fund? Yes. So the general fund is the fund where all the property, the main revenue source is the property taxes. Sure. So the, in, these investments are not in that fund. Correct. Am I answering your question? I think so. Okay. <laughs> so are we, ha, when, have you audited that, the, our actual fund balance? Yes. 12 and a half million. So we audit the pieces of the fund that culminate in the, in the fund balance, yes. Okay, and do we are we able to sufficiently invest those assets? I don't know what the general fund is invested in. Um, if that's just uh, short term cash, or in, I don't remember off the top of my head, Mike. Mayor, is it all right if Mr. O'Neill? Mike, would you help, come up and helps out. answer that question? <clears throat> It's primarily money market. It's uh, just low risk, short term uh, money market accounts uh, spread across the state's uh, stiff fund, which is run by the state, Webster Bank, People's Bank, Farmington Bank, and a couple of others, TD Bank. Are there other options that we have besides the money market account? We have a, uh, we do have an adopted investment policy for the general fund. Mm -hmm. um, which generally rest restricts it to that type of an investment. But we're always, you know, it's been very meager since 2008, basically. It's, it's, it's increased significantly in the last year compared to what we were earning. But, you know, again, it's, just, it's guided by the investment policy for the general fund. Okay. And is that something that the auditor reviews as far as policies and procedures? 
You're asking if we review the investment policy? Sure, and then what, and whether or not we're in compliance with our own investment policy. So we do, we don't, we, re, we, view, we view the investment policy as management's decision. You know, it's a, it's a management decision to, yeah. to invest in these various vehicles. And do you, is our policy in comportment with what other towns do around the area? So most towns do have an investment policy for their pension and OPEB funds, um, but we do not compare, you know, as, as long as there's a committee in place and you're, you're following the, the policy, then that's, that's pretty much what we look at. We don't compare policies among various towns. And how about, those are for the trust though, how about for the fund balance? So it's, it's the same thing, basically, for the general fund. The same thing being? Being that we don't really compare investment policies town to town to town. Have you seen, have you seen what ours is, how, how we handle the, our investments? So I don't know that um, I've seen it, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, don't, I can't really comment on it. It's not, it's not really in the scope of our audit, if you will. Okay, because you, you, would, you would identify items that would be out of range of some type of normalcy, no? So we are concerned that the general fund investments are within state statutes. That's pretty much what we look at. Okay. Okay. And are ours? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Anybody else have any questions on any of the fund information? Um, okay, so I think I'm on page nine. So as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, the town did adopt GASB Statement 75. As a result of that, your net position decreased 29.34 million because we had to remove the smaller liability under GASB 45 and record the larger liability under GASB 75. So there is, in the audit opinion, uh, uh, in, there is a paragraph that outlines that because we did have to make a prior period adjustment, which is part of adopting this new standard. Uh, your pension liability is 20.108 million, which is up slightly from the prior year of 19 million, and then the OPEB liability is 28.15 million, which is down from the prior year significantly. Uh, it was 43.3 million last year. In addition to the liabilities that are solely the town's liabilities, we are also required to disclose the town's piece if you will, the, the state's piece of the town's liability of your teachers for pension and OPEB. So the OPEB, li the OPEB disclosure was new this year, um, and so those amounts are listed in the presentation. So the town of Wethersfield teachers uh, liability that the state is responsible for, the town is not responsible for this amount, is 87.813 million. And then the OPEB liability, again, the town is not responsible for this amount. It's the state's liability is 22.602 million. And I know uh, there has been talk at the state level of transferring a third of the pension liability to the municipalities. So that's what they're talking about when they talk about this number. Just real quick, is the 87 Eight three one three, a third, or is that the full amount? That's the full amount. Any questions on the CAFR presentation? Okay. Um, on page ten, as I mentioned before, we performed a federal and a state single audit. So this kind of just summarizes the results of those. We have issued a clean opinion on both the federal and the state single audit. We did not find any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. And then I've listed the programs that we've tested for each. So for the federal single audit, we tested the special education cluster 
and state single audit, we tested Town Aid Road, body worn recording equipment, and open choice. <coughs> So I mentioned there were no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses, but we do like to give our clients suggestions for improvements to their controls and you know ideas about best practices in the industry. So we did issue a management letter. Um, there's no new comments this year. It's just a follow-up of the progress on the comments from prior years. So in the management letter, um, there's five comments uh, accounting procedures manual, the fraud tip line, financial management system security, non-town cash accounts, and then the fraud risk assessment. So you'll see in the letter what the comment is, and you'll also see what the 2018 update is and the progress of those comments. Could you just indicate where that letter is? In the it's, it's in your packet. In um, <laughs> it looks like this in bold. Oh, it's the front, this front letter? Well, the, so there's two letters. Okay. One is the required auditor's communication, one is the management letter. The management letter, in all caps, you can see prior year recommendations on the first page. Got it, found it. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And then on the last page of the presentation, um, I've listed the upcoming GASB standards uh, for 2019. There's two standards that are going to have to be implemented if they apply to you. GASB 83, certain asset retirement obligations, uh, and, and Statement 88, certain disclosures related to debt. I don't think that these are going to have any impact on the town. Um, in 2020, Statement 84 is the fiduciary activities standard. This is probably going to have an impact on the town um, where we're going to have to look at all the funds of the town to see if they meet the um, fiduciary activities definition. I think there will be some small changes. It won't be a, a huge impact, but we will have to implement that standard. And then in 2021 is Statement 87, which is leases. So now you're required to report all your operating leases on the balance sheet. And then Statement 89, which is very simple, um, you cannot capitalize interest anymore during a construction project. So, so far those are all the standards that the GASB has in store for you. Any very questions? Very good, thank you. Are there any other council questions? Do we have any count, uh, questions from the Board of Ed or? School staff, <coughs> thank you for attending. Appreciate it. Okay. Now, normally at this time we go into an executive session um, to discuss any issues that you may have. So do I have a motion to go into executive session? Yes, Mayor, I move we go into executive session. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the motion passes. We will go next door for executive session and then come back into um, regular session. Thank you. Yes. The Board of Ed, you are invited to the executive session.
Melissa and I have worked on a number of projects together for the town, and he, he emailed me that he got a phone call from the town manager. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear us? Yes. I don't think so. Tom's shaking his head no. The microphone's on? Oh, yes. there we go. Okay. Thank you all. We're back. Our next item on the agenda is public comment. Members of the public have five minutes to speak if you'd state your name and address. Is there anyone in the public who'd like to speak? Mr. Colantonio, come on down. Good evening, Gus Colantoni, 16 Morrison Avenue. Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you, you too. 2019 is going to be better than 2018. Uh, just a question, I guess. You know, I was talking, and uh, we have the housing authority in Wethersfield, and uh, we participate in the cost of uh, maintaining those housing, right? I assume. And, uh, and it gives uh, the, the possibility of uh, certain people that don't make as much money to go in these houses and and don't pay as much as, uh, as these apartments are worth it, I assume, which I, I think is a good idea. <laughs> but uh, the things that bother me, it's, uh, it's something that I complained already a couple years ago, maybe three or four years ago, and, uh, and here it comes again. <clears throat> I moved uh, in Wethersfield in 1973. I've been here now for, I guess, 45 years. In the back of me, there was an elderly couple they never had any kids, and uh, after a few years, they passed away. So in the meantime, they were paying taxes. So this, young, this lady, that uh, after she passed away, she left it, uh, the house to the nephew. <clears throat> and he's been living there for many years. He went in the army, came back, and uh, he has some issues. Somehow, he cannot hold a job. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's just like, you know, he has problems. So for the past three or four years, I guess, you know, he hasn't paid taxes. And this is, I'm ashamed of what happened to him. A few months ago, I guess, last year, they, uh, they auctioned his house. They auctioned his house. I think, like, you know, he owes about $30,000. He's out of work. And he cannot afford it. Now they auction his house and somebody's going to take it. So I guess they auctioned his house for $76,000. The town is going to take whatever it is, $20,000, and it gives him the rest. But now I have to ask the question, what is this poor guy supposed to do? 
here we are, like, you know, helping everything around, which is good. And when we really need help, we kick him in the butt when he's, when he's falling down. I, th- th- this is crazy. If he owes $100,000 worth of taxes and the house is worth $50,000, you've got to do something, yes. But if he owes $30,000 and the house probably in good condition and, you know, it's de- in disrepair now because of his condition, uh, but it's still worth, uh, let's say, $100,000. You kick him, you sell his house and kick him out of there? Is that fair? Is that right? Is that moral? This is, this, is, this is crazy. In other words, if somebody moves in Wethersfield, he has a nice job and they buy a house, and, and after a while something happens. He cannot pay the mortgage or they cannot pay the tax in three or four years, like, you know, you kick him out. Something that doesn't jive right here, or maybe I don't see it the way you guys see it, but I don't think this should happen. It's a disgrace. Now, keep in mind, in that, well, he's been paying taxes probably before I've been there for 45 years. He's been paying taxes for just as long. They never had anything, like, you know, nobody in school system. He never got anything from the town except the garbage and maybe snow removal, yeah? But over 45 years, what did he get in return? A kick in the butt. Since you, you have not paid taxes in three years, we got to sell your house and you're on your own. Is this fair, I'm asking you guys? Is this ethical? Is it moral? I, I, it's amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Gus. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Mr. Mazzarella? Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you. Happy New Year. So on tonight's agenda, we're going to talk about the vehicle lift again. And for some of you that weren't here the last go around, it was brought up in July, July 17th, 2017. And it's been tabled for roughly 18 months. I want to start out by just reading you some highlights of my comments that I made at the beginning of the meeting. <coughs> we were told that the lift was over 50 years old and it cannot service the majority of the vehicles in the truck fleet and it's past its useful life and it was a safety risk. Under the impact section of the uh, agenda item, it says the town garage will continue to be unable to perform work on the majority of the physical service vehicles and will incur costs of bringing vehicles to an outside ben- vendor. It is, and I asked at the time, is it the majority of the physical service vehicles or the majority of the heavy trucks? Some of these things got answered during the meeting. I asked if the lift was in service or if it was a safety risk why is it still in service as it's a huge liability to the town and to the people working under it we i'll continue i asked if they're unable to work on the vehicles what do we have five full-time mechanics doing i asked how many repairs needed a seventy thousand pound truck lift During the meeting, physical, Director of Physical Services, Sally Katz, stated that the current lift, at their best guesses, the lift was placed in the 1950s and is not usable right now and hasn't been used for years because the current capacity for that lift is far below what any of their trucks are even when they have no materials in them. Therefore, from a safety feature, it's unusable. It costs them money to send out their vehicles and their trucks for repair, and they have five mechanics that could be doing the repairs with no, with no lift. They can't do it in-house. They have to use an outside vendor. Former Mayor uh, Jeff Bridges uh, 
former town manager Jeff Bridges explained that uh, they have these five brand new mechanics that are highly trained, can do the work, and they're not making use of their abilities. Deputy Mayor Barry inquired how much has been spent sending trucks out in the last year and asked if there was any work that was being done in-house. Director Katz said she did not have that figure, but she could get it for them. Anytime they have to do a repair for hoses, diagnostics, for brakes, for working on any part of the dump body or any part of the truck, they're sending it out because they don't have a safe way of getting under the truck. She went on to say anything that they can get to from inside the cab, which is not a lot, or from inside the body of the dump part of it, some of the engine work, but nothing from underneath from a safety standpoint. About a week later, I went down to the town garage. Probably wasn't supposed to walk over there, but I did. And I took a picture of truck number 26. I'm not sure what size dump truck that is, but it was up on the lift, and the town mechanic was working on the truck. So what happened to, we haven't used it for several years. I got to say, everything that the director of physical services says regarding this lift at this point is subject. I don't believe it. She clearly didn't know what the real story was in 2017. Now she's provided us with an updated agenda item, and we have different reasons of why we need to replace the lift. Now it doesn't meet OSHA inspection. It was noted as a violation during a recent OSHA inspection. Recommendations from OSHA is to replace. I asked for the OSHA report. I was told it wasn't completed yet, and it was a pre preliminary review. I really find it hard to believe that if it's a safety issue, that an OSHA inspector is going to say, yeah, sure, just keep working under the truck and uh, see if you can get that fixed as soon as you can. My experience with OSHA is that's not the way it works. They shut you down. They tell you to stop using the piece or the item that's in violation. And they usually fine you. Now, there are some cases where you ask them in and they come and do an audit, kind of unofficial. But if it's a safety issue, they're not going to let you continue using the lift. So is it a safety issue or isn't it a safety issue? We're, we're going to hear some tonight about it, but I hope you will ask the question in earnest. The second point is the, it says the lift is not DEEP compliant due to lack of containment. The new lift is fully contained and regulated by DEP. Would you, <clears throat> would you finish up, Mr. Mazzola? I'll wrap up. Thank you. So I hope you ask some serious questions tonight, and I hope we get some real answers. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak? Come on up, Mr. Young. Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Uh, Tom brings up some real good issues about this lift. And uh, I've always said it's better and easier and cheaper to send it out to a vendor and have them work on it versus doing it ourselves and paying for a lift that is supposedly in is a dangerous thing to have in the shop, but it's currently being used, really, really sends a message about how much our people know and how um, they have concern for our taxpayer monies. So I would recommend uh, we hold off on this lift. We don't need this kind of thing, uh, not at this point. And, and where we're going, hey, we may not need it. Anyway, I've been talking to you about the Keisha farm over time. And it's going to go on, of course, for a long time. And it's regarding the prices of various properties in, in the community, in the area. 
uh, and what I could find online that is currently for sale. In the beginning, I, I spoke about five different properties that had sold. And then I moved on, to, and, and the last two properties of any size that sold were back in 2018. Um, and it was, like I say, one was in Windsor and one was over in Glastonbury. Um, and then, of course, I moved on to properties that were currently on the market. And what their prices per acre were, with none of them, with the none of them in the Harford area, coming near what we're going to pay for the Keisha farm. What I do find is properties off down by the coast, the Gold Coast, that are in the range that you're paying for the Keisha farm. And 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 I just want to recite them, and you know I'm going to be reciting the, all of them for a long time. Uh, I have 30 Red Hill, and you can go look online. This has all been recorded. You can go online, you can go to Google, Ma uh, Google Earth, and you can go view these properties. And, you know, they do exist. At least they exist in the listings that are out there. Number 30 Red Hill Road in Brantford, Connecticut. 18, 19 acres for $1,200,000. Sits on a flat piece of property or on a top of a mountain overlooking out to the Long Island Sound. Price is $1,225,000. You double that, you're right near what you're going to pay for a farm that only has a view to as far as you can see the trees. And this property, like I say, go to Google, Google Earth. Beautiful, lush property, not weeds, not rock like we have up here. Number 1675 Marion Street down in uh, Cheshire, Connecticut, eight acres. That's for $550,000, and that's $67,000, close to yours. Nice flat, nice flat farmland, well taken care of. But again, that's Cheshire, that's not here. We're, we're right next to Harford. We're in a depressed area, but you're willing to pay 75000 for not only the, the scrubby developable land, but also $75,000 for the six acres that are nothing else but wetlands, which have no value at all when you go buy land. You can't do anything with it. Unless you, the birds, they're the only ones that have any value to it. Maple, Hill, uh, Maple Avenue in Durham, Connecticut, not far away. Another high-priced one. Five acres, and I don't like going into these small ones, but five acres will cost you more per acre than if you're buying 30 acres. But this one here is selling for $48,000 an acre. That's still a good distance away from your $75,000. Nipsick Road over in Glastonbury. 90, 10, 11 acres, $99,000, that's $9,000 an acre, and they've just reduced it. They reduced it, a $99,000 property was, that's what it is now, it was reduced from 125 ish They reduced it, $26,000, $26,000 dollars they reduced it. That's a heck of a reduction. But again, Weathersfield will pay gold, Coast prices. Here you have another one in Haddam, Turkey, Turkey Hill Road in Haddam, 18 acres, $129,000. I don't need to tell you what that acre per cost acre is. It's cheap. If you'd finish up, please. Your yes, time I'll, is I'll, up. I'll continue, yeah. Um, 18, Old Turnpike Avenue, again, Haddam, 90 acres, another $8,000, $9,000 an acre. And, and that was another price cut of $10,000 for just. December 31st, 2018. Yeah, we're seeing these price cuts come along, yet you guys are not only paying a premium, you're pay, there, you should have been cutting that price. Thank you very much. I'll be back. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Anybody else? Okay. Seeing none, <clears throat> our next item of business, we have no hearings on ordinances and resolutions, so we'll move <coughs> into reports from boards and commissions. Are there any council members who have reports for this evening? Okay, I guess it was a slow week. 
Um, our next item is a discussion item, the revaluation process. Oh, okay, very good. Just be a minute while we get the assessor to come on in for that. This has been an odd meeting today <laughs> between the executive session and this. Good evening, welcome. <laughs> we are ready for you, come on up. If you would just introduce yourself, okay. Fauna, with your title. Good evening, I'm Fauna Eller Assessor, Town of Wethersfield. Um, this is Jay, I don't know, Sunbrook. Uh, he works for Equality Valuation. I had him come in case you guys had any questions for him as well. Um, I don't, did you guys read the narrative or do you want me to? If you could give us speak? a brief overview okay. of the process of the reval and all of that. Um, we did receive your memo in our okay. packets, but just for the public and those at home, if you could give a brief overview of the okay. process um, and some of the results, then we can ask questions Jay, do after. Wanna, do you want to give the brief of reval? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so this was a uh, state mandatory uh, five-year reval. Uh, every five years, a town has to go through a revaluation. And just to give everyone an idea what the process is, that what we do for a reval is we're updating values as to represent what the fair market value is during this time period. What I mean by this time period is uh, the state requires we use sales for at least one year, so from October of last year to October of this year as a starting point as far as determining how we set our values throughout the town. Um, what we did also is we sent out what's called a data mailer to everyone in town that had all the information on their house. This way, if there was any issue as far as wrong information, they could fill it out, return it, call, talk to somebody, and, and go over that information. Um, then once that's done, we basically go through and set up the values for the town, residential and commercial, condo. Um, then notices were sent to all the people to show what your assessment was five years ago and then what it is proposed now with this uh, reevaluation. Then they were allowed to have an informal hearing where they could send something in to basically whether they didn't agree with the value or, or felt maybe information was wrong and that process is even still going on right now as we speak. So that's a basic overview as far as what happens in a reevaluation. Um, in the, again, in a five-year period. Very good, thank you. And Fauna, would you talk to some about some of the results of yep. this latest um, one? Yep. So um, let's see here. So the gross gross grand list went up ninety-nine million seven hundred twenty thousand. You have that in your mm -hmm. report there. Um, let's see. Looks like about five thousand. So roughly half stayed the same or went down and then everybody else increased a small percentage and then we had a higher amount um, five percent or more increased 1200 1200 increased five percent or more sorry and it looks like the larger percentage was in the commercial real estate mm -hmm. yeah. are there any council members who have questions about the process Go ahead. Hi, Fawn. I just wanted to follow up with some of the results that you had. Can you explain the difference to folks who might not understand the commercial versus residential? Because you had delineated in your memo some of the things mm -hmm. that might make a residential go up yeah. or down. Um, yeah, residential is houses, vacant land, um, and commercial is your commercial properties like shopping plazas, apartments, and they're I, I split them out just so people could 
see their differences, residential versus commercial, because we had a lot of commercial properties selling for significantly more than what we had placed on them in the last reval. So I split that out as a separate item just so you could see that change. What would make something change that dramatically? Market, and especially for commercial properties. Either, either it was market, um, I don't know what you say, market interest or market desirability, um, or we were too low before. And then for residential, you delineated things like um, people doing things to their homes, correct? Additions, things we found over the past years, five years, um, things they've noticed in their data mailer. We also use the aerial imagery mm -hmm. to find stuff. So we did a lot of work. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from counselors? Councilor Hurley, go ahead. They just had one. Red Lobster went up that much. Yes, yeah, I, I noticed that too. It sold like, three times in the past five years. Three times? So those numbers are accurate. Got a lot of other development huh? there too. Doesn't seem like you can make that much money in a Red Lobster, but somebody, I guess, because. <laughs> Did you go there a lot in the last I haven't, <laughs> I haven't been there, I don't think, ever. <laughs> Did something happen to the property? Did they add another building to the property? Or it was just that one restaurant that's gone up in value that's of almost 400 that's what somebody's willing to pay to receive the income for that property. Wow. Okay. Well, good for Red Lobster. Yeah. Um, any other questions, Councilor Hurley? No. I'm okay. Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor. I have two questions, Fauna. Thank okay. you, first of all, for You're all welcome. the work. And thank you. Um, first off, I see the overall grand list was up 4.6%. Mm -hmm. Do you I know what it was, was at the last revaluation? No, I do not, but I could... I could let you know. Yeah, I'm wondering if it, this is a more significant increase or less or, or not. So if you could get okay. us that, that yeah, would be I can, great. I can. And then I'm not sure, and I might have missed it, or it's, maybe it's not part of the scope of this um, reval work, but the corresponding new mill rate in terms of the impact, is that, or is that Mike? Mike? Is that, or is that, or we don't know that information. I, I do not have the answer to that. <laughs> But based on what does it change? Oh, oh. Mike O'Neill, finance director. Assessors always lock up. As soon as you say mill rate, <laughs> no, no. they're value only, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. no more words. No. Um, I guess I will give you the best answer I can give you. It's kind of a non-answer, but it's it's a function of this valuation will not affect the current mill rate. It's simply the basis, the value, the tax base that's used for future budget, which will, and, and the mill rate for the future budget is a function of the expenditures budgeted, revenues that we get from the state or don't get from the state, and, um, you know, other factors, but basically those two. Sorry. No, no, I got it. Thank you. But it would be fair to say that we would anticipate a decrease in the mill rate based on a five, almost 5% 5 increase in the um, grand list. Is that accurate? I think the best thing you could say is if everything else was equal, that that would be the case. Okay. If you have more tax base, yeah. a lower mill rate will give you the same tax revenue. Thank you. Councilor Forrest, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. I was curious... Um, I don't know if we have this yet, but the percentage, we're, we're often looking at the percentage of our tax base that's on a commercial and industrial level versus the residential level. Mm -hmm. And is it possible to know uh, how, what the anticipation is of the, the shift from, I think you said, the shift from residential to commercial and understanding what those percentages are? I don't know. If, maybe they are in here, but I didn't quite see I that. Don't, no, I don't, I don't have that in there yet just because we're working on getting the software here to be able to bridge it to our we have an admin software that we use to run a lot of those numbers and I don't have that yet okay. um, and currently what I have is a little difficult to give me give you those exact numbers but we will definitely get it right. when we sign the ground list at the end of the month just currently it's we're in this sure phase where we're shifting when you, when you get yeah there. yeah oh you we do I do I send it to Kathy I'm like Kathy look 
understanding what New we year. have for uh, <laughs> what the load is borne by each sort of sector of our community mm -hmm. and, then, and then the change of course is an yep. interesting part would be good information to have and then the second follow-up question is like, I'm pretty sure that we evaluate at 70 percent of what we sort of believe the market value is is that mm -hmm. accurate yeah is there a reason that we use 70 percent rather than just do 100 percent or 50 percent i've seen other people uh, i've heard of other people doing it at different levels but why the 70 uh state law it just says it's and even 70%. ones who do a different percentage of state law was adopted so that they could do that no kidding hartford has special legislation yeah that's who i was talking mm -hmm. to and i i thought it was but then oh hear rumors <laughs> yeah no we I can't just say I want to use 75 we have to we have to do 70 and is there do you know if there was any basis for that when they made the law that that was a thing like why would they do it's that? before my time I, I don't okay. I do not know <laughs> I, I thought maybe in the assessor's world like everybody knew and yeah. I'm not in the assessor's world, so all right if you do find out if you could pass along a note that would be great <laughs> Okay, are there any other questions, Councillor Rell? It's not a question, but more a comment. Um, from your lips to God's ears, I would love to have a <laughs> decrease in the mill rate. We're at 41 and change. <laughs> well above, well not well above, but above 40, which is higher than most our neighboring towns. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we all saw the email or letter um, this weekend from one of the constituents uh, from a low of 26 to our high of 41.1. Um, we're up there um, you know hopefully with new administration we would not see any more cuts to um, our uh, revenue sources from the state as well as any kind of uh, increased um, bargaining costs so mm -hmm. if we can keep all that down you continue to do the good job that you're doing on you know uh, reval and assessing the properties at the true cost that they should be assessed at and hopefully we will get down to below 40. So That'd be great. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, Fauna, thank okay. you for coming. Thank you. Appreciate <coughs> your time. Our next discussion is the pavement preparation restoration contract renewal of contract with general paving and construction. Derek, welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Uh, my name is Derek Gregor. I'm the town engineer. I'm here tonight to talk about the town's miscellaneous pavement preparation and restoration contract. <clears throat> you have to bear with me. I'm feeling a little under the weather today, so I apologize for that. Um, currently, a contractor working under this contract is General Paving and Construction out of Rocky Hill, Connecticut. They uh, recently contacted me um, with their contract having just expired uh, end of December looking for a three-year extension to their contract, and for that they would be willing to offer a 5% reduction, again, in their unit prices under the contract. Just to give you a little bit of history, um, this co company's been working for the town uh, consistently since 2005. Um, they're kind of an extension of town staff. They work very closely with my staff on the paving program every year. This contract requires a responsive contractor um, because they are very integrated with that program. They do some work before milling work gets done, they do some work after milling but before paving, and then they also do some work after paving. So for us, it's very important to have a contractor that's responsive and available. And they've, they've done a very good job with the town with that over, the, over many years. This contract's been bid three times in 2005, 2011, 2014. Each time they were the low bidder. Um, in 2014, they were the only bidder that submitted. As I indicated, or as I indicated, the contract just expired. So to, to bring you up to date on that, in 2014, they were awarded a contract July 1st. That expired June 30th, 2017. Uh, that spring, I had come to the council asking for an 18-month extension to their contract, which would bring us through December 2018. Uh, with that, they had offered a 5% reduction in all of their 2014 unit prices that they had bid. So with, with the requesting now is if we were willing to give them another three-year extension, they would deduct another 5% off of their 2014 unit prices to avoid having to <clears throat> go through the whole bidding process and, <clears throat> and what comes with that. So essentially we'd be looking at unit prices for every line item. I had given you a spreadsheet in my submittal that kind of shows all the line items we have in the contract. 
um, what they bid in 2014, what we're paying today, and what we would be paying if we opted to extend their contract. They generally constitute about a third of the cost of our paving program every year. Um, in addition, they do do some work uh, outside of that for the town, uh, for physical services, um, for engineering, when we need some road work done and maybe physical service not available to do it, they, they're available to do that work for us. Um, but as a, just a general uh, estimate, if we extend the contract, I would expect we'd save uh, an additional $20,000 per year from what the 2014 prices were. So based on their 2014 prices, we're already saving 5% or about 20,000. We would save about another $20,000 a year if we were opting to, to take them up on, on this offer. Um, as you can see in your memo, I had put together some numbers on what I would expect. Um, we, I looked at our four you know, top items that we used the most over the last few years just to kind of see how they would compare to other projects um, or what I would expect for bid pricing. And I feel like um, you know their, their pricing, their proposed pricing is, is very good. Um, but I was here tonight basically just to talk as a discussion item and see how the council felt about that. Any other council questions? <coughs> Councilor Latina? Sorry, I'll keep it quick. I'm sorry you're sick. Um, the actual contract that they're in currently, when does it expire? It just expired end of December. It did. Yes. Um, have we ever done an extension like this with them before? Yes, we, we did the just the 18-month extension that just expired end of December. Um, from my understanding from the contracts, uh, the solicitations we had in 2005, mm -hmm. I believe that was a three-year contract that got extended a number of times. Um, then we went out to bid in 2011. That was just a three-year. We went out to bid again in 2014, and that's brought us up in four and a half years up to where we are today with their contract just having have expired. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Councilor Hurley? So your estimation is that if we go out to bid, you don't think we'll get a lower bid price? Are it's, our prices down on things? And uh, it, it's hard to know what would happen. Um, I would say that based on my conversations that I've had with this contractor, um, you know, I would expect, and he had kind of indicated, he, he would not be bidding that low if he was going to rebid. He, would, cause he, he, he probably would come in closer to something like he had in 2014 or a little bit higher, which is more what I would expect. Um, but, you know, it depends on how much he wants it. So it's really hard to know that. I will say one thing about this contract, and I was trying to express that, is um, being that they serve as an extension of town staff, and that's how I look at them, because when we call them, they show up. Um, that's very hard to find in contractors today. I mean, certainly if we were to bid it, we'd write all that into the specs. We'd have meetings with them, discuss it before we signed a contract. but very often they're not there when you need them um you know i've only been here a couple of years but even talking to my staff that's been working with them since 2005 they say that you know they've been very good to work with I, that's been my experience coming here i wasn't quite sure with this whole arrangement how that would work but i've been pretty impressed with how responsive they are and like i said um our paving program constitutes a lot of the money that we spend every year on in our infrastructure and having that contractor available when we need them they are on site while the work's being done by other contractors uh, is very helpful to us um, because if we have a contractor who's not being responsive, that's really going to cause problems with our state contracts uh, for milling and paving. Sometimes those guys, if you say we got to delay you a week, it means you've delayed them two months because they have other projects they're going to move to before they come back to you. So um, it is a very fluid operation. It seems to work very well and they, they integrate very well. So it's been, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's been a benefit to the town to have that. Um, and if they were willing to, you know, take prices from four and a half years ago and reduce them by 10%, I'd, you know, I think that would be something we should, worth considering. Okay, thanks. Other council members? Deputy Mayor? Uh, just, just some comments uh, on this. Uh, I'm aware of, you know, the work that uh, General Paving has done over uh, the many years, and they have been very receptive to the needs of this town. If you think back a couple of years ago, uh, there's a three-part to this. It's the miscellaneous prep, it's the milling, and it's the paving. Uh, the other two parts are through a state bid, which are through Tilcon, and Tilcon bought out the milling company so that we have coordination there that makes life easier for Derek on getting the work done on time. Now, now that contract is also doing state work, so he coordinates with them. This contract that has to interrelate with them has been very receptive over the years to the town. 
the owner lives in town and takes pride in his town and is trying to help us out. I mean, Derek's going to say we're going to save $20,000 if we do this, but we're also saving other staff time and money and not going out to bid again. And, you know, my personal opinion, because of the relationship that his staff has with them and the cohesiveness is here uh, and getting the job done. I mean, pavement is something we want to get done every year. We don't want to postpone it into another year if we don't have to. So my suggestion would be to uh, recommend that this go on the next agenda for consideration uh, to award it to them. Uh, so those are my thoughts. Any other comments or questions? Councilor Forrest? So we're gonna, I'm going to have a little chuckle, but did they, were they the ones that paved Garden Street at Main Street? No, they were not. Okay. That was a... Well, that's a good start. <laughs> that was an MDC contractor. Uh, it was there. That, do we know who that was by any chance? Uh, that did the paving work? Yeah. B&W paving. B&W. B &W. Uh, yeah. Good to know if we have to go out to bid. We've... Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, work, you, work, you have your reputation. Um, is there any policy that we have or, like, related to, you know, bidding contracts and... and ext I mean, sometimes... I hear, like, I remember in counting and stuff like that, you know, usually it's like a three-year thing or a four-year thing. Is What is our policy for policy policies for bidding out contracts and recommendations and so on and so forth? Would this be uh, Come on up. This be outside of the norm? I, I am asking. Construction contracts are different than other contracts? Um, in this? The council adopted, has adopted a procurement policy. Um, it does not specify uh, duration of contracts. It just simply, I mean, it, it, we have to bring any contract to you that's in excess of $30,000 and is multi-year. So we really you know, rely on the approval of the council for any significant contracts. Sure. Well, how about re bidding and rebidding and uh, contract extensions is, is, the, is our sort of policy silent as to any of that type yes of? yeah <clears throat> except except for the magnitude of the contract you know it sort of forces contracts by magnitude to, sure. to this forum um, and is there do we know if there's any state laws and so forth I know that there's some discussion about you can go off a state bidding contract or not and then if you do go out to bid you have to open it up I'm sure there are some requirements as to notice and things like that but is there anything related to a contract extension that would require any of the state laws or regulations to be impacted? No, For example, no nothing I'm like aware of. A notice out there, I don't, you know, or something like that. No, we, we're it's at the discretion of the town to to bid as it and procure as it sees fit. Okay. And we use, I mean, for our state contracts go, we, the state, goes through their process to. Uh, to contract with vendors, and then they make those terms available to uh, to cities and towns. So those, to the extent that we make use of a state contract, where we've a we've said we agree with the process that the state has, or or there are other organizations like Krog that we use as well. So we look at the process that they use, um, but again, their process would dictate how they handle and administer those contracts. And they just simply make them those same terms available to us. Right. Okay. Thanks, Mayor. Are there any other comments or questions? Just to clarify um, your question, Matt, uh, yeah. you had asked about Garden Street. That was MDC. <laughs> okay. you, you may have said Main Street. I don't know if you did or not. I know we had some. Garden and Main, actually. Yeah, we had. Yeah, okay. So Garden Street was not. I know you had some. Uh, you raised some concerns that were we were aware of with the manholes on Main Street. Well, I almost lost my transition from Ruth's house. <laughs> I understand. That that uh, that was this company. They are aware of it. and They're going to repair those issues in the spring. So, Which company? Uh, this that was Tilcon. That was not the company that we're talking about for this. But that was part of our paving program. Okay. They kind of work with them on this, but. Uh, that usually doesn't happen. That's a rarity. I have not seen that happen in the two years I've been here, but uh, we'll have it taken care of. Okay. I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else from council? And do we have a consensus to um, have this on the next agenda for a, a renewal? 
I don't, I don't think we need a vote tonight, but if we, we could refer, we could refer it on to the meeting. Yeah. <coughs> we could. If, it's up to you, Mayor. <laughs> it's fine. Would you like to make a motion to sure, refer it to the uh, agenda? Let's put our let's flex our muscles a little, so to speak. Uh, I move to refer the five percent reduction Tilcon contract for it's renewal to the uh, main agenda to the agenda meeting for our next regularly scheduled council meeting for review. Second. Uh, Just. Oh. I think you said the wrong company. This Did is I? General Paving. General, General Paving. Not, not, Tilcon. Tilcon. not Tilcon. Oh, sorry. Uh, Amended to say. I move. I don't want to amend. I with. I withdraw it. <laughs> <laughs> can I do it? Try again. You no. can go right ahead. <laughs> move to refer the contract of which we are discussing right now for General Paving to the main <laughs> uh, to the main agenda for the next council meeting, the next regular council meeting. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Are there any comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Motion to refer carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the uh, information. Appreciate it. Hope you feel better, Derek. Our next item is the physical services lift that has been on the table for all eternity. Welcome, Sally. Welcome, <coughs> Rich. Good evening, Sally Katz, Director of Physical Services. Rich Bailey, Assistant Director of Public Works, Physical Services. Um, the first thing we'd like to, do, or I would like to do, is clarify some comments that were made tonight. Um, first, when we brought this lift uh, to Council in the first hand, um, one of the things that was discussed is that the lift is over 50 years old. The lift. Was, is continuing to be in use. However, there are vehicles that are owned by the town that cannot go on to the lift. They exceed their poundage. And if that was not clarified a year and a half ago, I apologize for that. We did have an OSHA inspection. The things that were cited in the OSHA inspection is that where the main switches are for the lift are placed in a place now where OSHA no longer allows them to be placed. For example, they are underneath the electrical panel in the bay. That is technically a violation. It is not unsafe to use. Otherwise, you are correct, Mr. Mazzarella, we would have been tagged. However, there are we cannot fight age. We cannot fight the fact that when the lift was put in, there were not the environmental regulations that there are now, and that the trucks that we purchase, including fire trucks, which is why I've also asked Chief Bailey, who is um, also the Assistant Director for Operations for Physical Services here tonight, is that we are unable to put any of our fire trucks up on a lift nor can we put um, our newer dump trucks up on the lift. And so we are fighting against time. And the reason why I say fighting against time is Newington had a lift which was the same as ours. And it was actually a few years younger. And they had a problem and it ended up because it is a lift that doesn't have containment caused environmental issues. And so I just wanted to clarify a few of, of those things that had been said um, in case they were um, in question or cloudy. Um, other than that, the lift is a piece of equipment that we use every day. Uh, trucks go on the lift. It allows our mechanics to go in and efficiently maintain our equipment. There is a reason why we have mechanics. We have mechanics because we efficiently maintain our equipment to keep it out on the road, to keep our, our equipment available to the people who utilize that equipment. If we were unable to service our trucks in-house and we are in a snowstorm or potentially tomorrow morning and a truck goes down, then that elongates the amount of time it is going to take us to do our job. 
when we bring a truck into the town garage to be fixed, in most cases, it is fixed and back on the road within a day. If we have to send trucks out, then we have to, if a truck goes down, we have to tow it to wherever, which is either Cromwell or in Hartford. And then we have to wait until we are in the queue to get our vehicles fixed. That's not efficient. That's not timing efficient, and it's also not cost efficient because we will be paying for state contracted people and their hourly wage to be doing the work. We will be paying markup, retail markup on parts, and we will be waiting to get our equipment back. When we bring it into the shop, our people are highly skilled and trained. We have the ability to fix, we have the ability to get the parts, we get the parts not at a retail cost, and we get in there, we fix it, and we get the trucks back on the road. We get our fleet working. We don't have trucks down. And now that our fleet is expanding and modernizing, modern, modern trucks weigh more. And we want to be able to maintain them. If you look at the average age of our trucks, we average 12, 14, 16 years, our fire vehicles even longer. We want to be able to keep our trucks in service. And we do do some of the work on the ground, as Mr. Mesrell had asked during the last uh, question and answer session. It is not optimal to do. It elongates the time to be done. It's also not, um, it is the difference between someone being able to look up and look at an entire vehicle or someone being on their back below a vehicle and having a narrow range of sight to be able to do their work. We did look at other things that had been requested about the lifts and because of the physical um, constraints of the garage, a hydraulic lift is the type of lift that is recommended for that location. Okay. Oh, I don't, I don't <coughs> Thank know. you. Are there counselors who have questions? Councilor Forrest, go ahead. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Sally, I, just, I saw your responses to Mr. Mazzarella. I just thought that they were direct to the point, thoughtful, responsive, and just thank you for, they, they were thoughtful questions and they were thoughtful responses. And it was just a nice civil engagement. It was nice Absolutely. to see just like, you know, <laughs> instead of the crazy, which you can see sometimes. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Um, do you have any type, uh, you don't have to right here, but whether it's an analysis, which might be an overstatement, or some type of an evaluation, on you know what we spend sort of on a yearly basis or some type of average yearly basis to out to send the stuff out to, for the price markup on the parts or anything like that, the alternative, caught the fit, like the economic cost opportunity cost if you will. Right. Well, we, I did ask one of our mechanics who used to work um, at one of the local places, yeah. and um, we did check an average markup on a part is anywhere from 20 to 25 percent. It, it could be even more depending on how obscure the part is. Um, but on average, your markup is 20 to 25 percent. When you're working, when you're looking at costs um, as far as what it costs um, per hour for someone. No, I'm talking about like you must have a part of your line, a line item in your budget that has to pay all these people. And by all these people, I don't mean the mechanics in your shop. I mean that Hartford service center that towed that truck out there the, for the, those parts well, to do that repair. Right. Like, you know, all those invoices for, I don't know where you send them. Where do you send Do you have a name? Like um, Central Auto or whatever, it, it, in Murphy's Road, right? I mean, yeah, there, there's actually right. very little, you know, that our mechanics can't do. You know, so the, if you're looking for a hard number on what we spent on subbing things out, yeah. which we could get that. I mean, yeah. Sally would have to get that, but. Sure. You know, there's, you know, 90, 95 plus percent of the work is all done in-house. Right. But I mean, if we're saying like, hey, if we want to get to 100 percent of the work in-house and this right. lift is going to get us there, right. I was just curious, well, what's the 5 percent that we sub out? Is it $20,000 a year? Is it $10,000 a year? Is it, is, it, is it a $350 tow job? Is it $100,000 a year? You know, well, that would depend on how much the 5 percent is. You know, you can't take a, just a dollar figure and take 5 percent of it. 
you know, it would be based on the age of the trucks, the repairs of the trucks, how mm -hmm. bad the winter was, you know, how much they were beaten down and how much repair they needed. If you look in the agenda pack, there is a comparison of, I'm going to sound, I'm not going to sound great here, mm -hmm. uh, dump truck pump. And it looks like Sally said the cost to replace it uh, for the town of Wethersfield, 400 for the parts, 124 for the um, the mechanics, total cost, 524. Trucks were to be back on the road the same day to outsource a truck repair. Truck repair facilities are located in Hartford and Cromwell. Repair to facility <laughs> utilizes two employees. State contract rate of $95 an hour for five hours. Average labor cost, $950. Parts including markup, $500. Cost to replace a pump, $1840. So I don't know if that helps, Matthew. That's on uh, C1A, but there a, is a comparison of a dump truck pump repair. Correct. That, and that was an actual one that happened? Well, that was when we called and... Um, th what we charged, yes, the $524, that is, we've repaired the pumps. And yes, when um, I called around and I asked people in the industry um, who used to work in places like that, sure. what are the costs for these things, that is as true a cost as I could get. So there are the state contract personnel costs, what the average markup is on <coughs> something like a pump, and then the the tow, we did actually have to have a truck towed, so I know that $390 within town is correct, and it would elongate depending on how far we had to take it. So for in Hartford, 390 could be 500 I don't know specifically, but it would be a minimum of 390 And so that we know that that is as close to a comparison as, as I could give to you. Um, for that type of work. The same thing, I gave a, a second um, example of routine maintenance, the same thing, called around and said, what would you charge? And, um, and then also utilize the experience of people who used to work in those types of facilities. So, I mean, uh, so I'm hearing the opportunity cost is basically three things. We've got the efficiency of being able to have it not leave the yard, use of the vehicle, vehicles, you know, that sort of capital expenditure use capex i guess you might call it then there's the downtime loss like you have mm -hmm. to use another truck and get that one on board mm -hmm. and then there's the actual cost of the repairs and transportation and markups right so i guess over the last i was I was wondering if we could this is like an individualized basis and I'm, I'm not trying to get too much into the weeds but i'm trying to understand the opportunity cost of doing this i'm generally on, on board with it but i'm still trying to understand it mm -hmm. and that is like how much have we spent to send all, all of this stuff for jobs that we couldn't do now because right now we're limited because I, I think I remember one of your responses was like there's 400 or 300 and something vehicles that can't use right. this lift right now so we have to send those out when they're down or am, well, I, or am I misinterpreting you're response? misinterpreting a little right. there are a few there are a few vehicles in our fleet now which we cannot put on that lift much of the work that we do on it on those vehicles we can do with someone going underneath the vehicle. Right. And so it elongates the amount of time it takes us to do those repairs. Understood. And so that's one of the efficiencies that we would yep. see. Um, so for example, on, on a fire truck, we can do a lot of the work. We have tried not to send things out and take the time to send someone under a truck Mm -hmm. to do the work so that we're not incurring these marked up costs. It's costing us some time, but we're not. Our time, the time of our mechanics versus the upcharge parts and the time of the mechanics in another place, we weigh each thing. And I will say that there are times when I will have one of our mechanics work on something for a few days versus sending it out, it's not as efficient, but it's what we have to work with. Understand. Um, and so, you know, when I, I, does that answer your question? I'm not. It, I understand it from an efficiency standpoint, from a use of your staff standpoint, from a down, uh, from the downtime of the CapEx standpoint. Mm -hmm. And it, you don't have to answer this right now, but if you could at least get, if it's possible to get the town manager what the expenses that we've had for the times that we couldn't 
fix the big heavy right. fire truck and, and the rest of it that we had to tow back and forth, that we had to pay the markup on costs, that we had to send it out to Hartford or Berlin or wherever we had to send it to get it fixed. And understanding, I understand there's three buckets, and I was just trying to understand that third one. Yeah. It's okay if we don't have the number right now. I, I get this. Is, yeah. I'm not trying, there's no gotcha question here. Just if you could provide that yeah. for the next time, because I'm sure it will be good for analysis. And I will get you that, but one of the other things that I'm not being very articulate in saying is that some of those things that we would have no choice to send out if we didn't move forward with this, right now we've chosen to take elongated periods of time so that we don't send things out. Elongated period of times in repairing of the vehicles? Yes, because. Okay. <coughs> I've worked at fixed cars, I get it. You gotta have the right tools, I, I get it. Okay. Councilor Bell. Thank you guys. Um, hopefully this is a pretty easy question for you. Um, Unfortunately, I couldn't see it on our list of um, previous agenda items, but I went back as far as I could go on here, and it was January 9th of last year, and it was a hold for this item, which we've seen mm -hmm. meeting after meeting. Uh, what was the original cost for a replacement? The original cost two years ago when it was put into the budget was $165,000. <laughs> and was that also by this firm out of um, Bristol, Ray Jurgen? Yes. Now, did they go up for any other reason from 165 to 170? In the time, because it's been two years since the money was allocated, um, they've had price markups because of their manufacturing of this lift. Okay. So when we called to get the updated price, um, it would not exceed 170. Um, oh, okay. So they've held true to that, not yes. not to exceed. Yes. The hundred and seventy thousand dollars was budgeted for it was, in this most recent budget. No, actually, the budget previous to this. And it was kept in, if I'm not mistaken, this most recent budget. Yes. So the money has was actually allocated and voted on and adopted two years ago, and has been held. Oh, Mike left. And has been held. The money is there for us to be able. Uh, to utilize it if that's the choice of the council. And then on a side note, the position of a shared services position for the Board of Ed and the town side that fell under, that was, was there a position, uh, like a, a second or a, I know when we, when you took your elevated position, yes. there was also another position. Yes. Uh, has that been filled? Yes, the custodial manager position has yeah. been filled, and then we had a retirement of the executive secretary. Uh, the executive secretary, there was not an equal to position on the town side. That position transitioned to the town. It is a technical assistant for physical services. That position has also been filled. So for the first time, I am finally at full staff. Full, fully staffed. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilor Hurley? Was this put out to bid back two years ago? Yes, and it was also off, us, it was off the NJ, NJPA, the buying consortium. Um, so it's kind of like buying it off the state bid because we belong to a number of different buying consortiums and that had the best pricing. Um, and that is, that is who makes it. Okay, so, thanks. So it was competitively done previously, yes. And are they holding? Because I see that this proposal is dated August 2018. They, yes, they, they will are. hold that price? Yes, we confirmed that last week. Okay, good. Deputy Mayor? Uh, just like to make a couple of comments. Uh, I've had the, I could say, fortune of seeing that operation for many years being down there in the past. And uh, that lift will, uh, what costs are not included in there that Sally's not saying which he can't because it would take a lot of work to do it, is, okay, when that truck goes you know, out to be fixed versus being done in house, let's take a dump truck first. During the winter, during the snowstorm, I've seen a truck come in uh, that had to go up on that lift, and those mechanics worked like crazy and got that back out within a couple hours. Mm -hmm. If they didn't and it had to sit to go out, now the 
crews have to go out and do that other crew's job and it takes longer to get the streets done and does more wear and tear on all the other vehicles that are out there. That's an unrelated cost that's not included in here, which is the savings we will have by having that truck there because it won't affect our other vehicles as much. Number two, let's go to the fire trucks next, uh, which, Rich, you know, I'm glad you wear two hats. Uh, that's needed for some of those bigger trucks, and you know, I can appreciate you keeping them in and taking longer to do them, but some of those trucks are specialties. Mm -hmm. Those trucks should be available as quickly as possible to be out there because, God forbid, somebody has a problem with their house where that truck is needed and not there. That damage to that property is going to be worse than it would have been, and you can't put a price tag on that. So I just want to make those comments known and you know, say we should consider moving this thing forward. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Councilor Forrest? I'm going to move to refer the purchase and installation of a truck lift from Ray Jurgison for $170,000 to our next regular council meeting. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The motion to refer carries. Thank, Thank you, for you your for time. your time, Sally. Much appreciate, appreciate it. it. Uh, our next item of business, we have no ordinances or resolutions for introduction, so we will move back into the public comments section. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak? Mr. Colantonio, come on up. Good evening again, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. It was kind of nice, uh, the efficiencies and whatnot. I, uh, I kind of like to hear when we can save money someplace, I guess, you know. And by doing work inside, I guess in-house, it's uh, probably it's a little bit cheaper. Which uh, brings me, though, to Mr. Rell question, though. A lot of us in, in Wethersfield are elderly. We don't work anymore. And yet, we are one of the the surrounding towns with the highest, uh, what, what do you call it? Like, no you know, rate. there you go, 41. It's a lot. What are we doing wrong? <laughs> I guess, I, I don't know. You know, I have to agree with her. Efficiency is important. <coughs> Years ago, they used to take the garbage. Now it's private. I wonder why. But anyway, uh, I went to Christmas Eve church. I guess it was last year. Coming back, I almost got into an accident. Why? And where? It's just around the corner. Now, I just brought it to the town engineer and probably he's going to address it. Right in front of uh, the school driveway on Walcott Hill Road. That, what a mess. A few years ago, I guess, maybe the town with uh, the previous town engineer, you know, put a lot of signs. Now, if you are driving south and you get like, you know, in the vicinity of the driveway to the school, on that side alone, there is left lane must turn left. There are two signs of those, maybe 50, 60 feet apart. And there are two more signs, no stopping or standing <coughs> anytime. It's four. And then very close to the driveway, there is no parking no parking school days, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And I read it. Well, I've been an engineer all my life. What the heck does no parking school days, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. means? Now, keep in mind that right in front of this driveway to the school, it's not just one lane in each direction, that's it. Basically, in that area, it's the only place where you have one lane in each direction plus a left lane. In other words, you can turn left when you go south and you can turn left when you go north to the driveway. And I said, why? Well, coming back, I almost, there was, there was this car just parked across from the driveway to the school. And it's right in the lane. And do I blame the guy that parked there? No, because he must have read. He says, no parking school days, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. 
Oh, 11 o'clock at night, I mean, it's not a school day. So, I mean, what's going on? The only thing they need, the only thing they need is one sign in both directions which says left lane must turn left and then no parking anytime. Never mind school. There is no shoulder there. The lane line is right at the curbing. So why does the sign say no parking school days, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m.? To me, it does not make sense. But then, I don't know. I did not design it. I don't know if a, if a private guy did it, like a consultant, or I don't know if it was done in-house. But what's there is a complete mess, and I hope that some, something gets done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Mr. Young? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, it was interesting to see the auditors came this year before the council, whereas last year it was held somewhere else at a different hour, if I recall correctly. But uh, hopefully that will be online soon, that report. Are you going to make that available to us? I hope, so we can read it and review it. Um, Mr. Rell, in his comment regarding the $40, $41 mill rate, you're so right. But I disagree with uh, the, your comment that the way things are going to work, I, I got the impression you said that the, uh, we will get below $40. That's the impression I got sitting out here. No, the answer is we will not get below $40. We will continue to rise because of our inefficiencies here in, in, at the council and how we, how we vote on our spending, like tonight with the lift, and how we vote on all the other issues and how we don't try to hold back on spending. We spend like mm, there isn't any tomorrow. It's like buying the Keisha farm. You're paying Gold Coast price for that piece of property. And it has no value like that. None whatsoever. I've given you how many properties and all the different values. And if you look at those, there isn't any way the Keisha farm is worth anywhere near that. I can't wait till it's over because I'm going to ask you to justify how you came up with that price. And I think you're going to have to show us because I, I have not seen anything in this area as raw farmland for open space or anything like that that is selling for $75,000 an acre. And we have beautiful towns around us with nice land. And we have properties in, all over the state with a rarity to see that kind of a price. Yeah, there are some prices much higher when you get down even further on the Gold Coast. But when you get down to a lot of areas, richy areas, we're seeing the 70s and 75,000. But Weathersfield is not a valued town like that and, and doesn't deserve to have property. Well, it doesn't deserve to have us pay for property at that value. Go and look at your own Wilkes farm. Go look at the street card. And you see, it's, it's almost the way it's written is wrong. The values that you put on that property, the value of the property today is zero. Or darn close to zero per acre. Because it's got state easements on it. You can't put a building on it. You can't put a shed on it. You can't put a roadway on it. You can't do a thing with it. You can't even sell it. It has no value. But you're paid three and a half million dollars for it, Dolores. You paid that. Yeah. That was a smart move. <laughs> In your case, that was a smart move, right? 
Yeah, well, in business, you'd be in bankruptcy court, Dolores. But in, in, in Weathersfield, we make the citizens pay. And they pay dearly because that property has no value, only open space. But we paid $3.5 million. But anyway, that's, um, you know, there's more properties out there that I've noticed that, have, uh, s that are for sale. I'll, I'll talk about them at the next meeting. And uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Mr. Mazzarella, come on up. Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. So in continuing with my discussion on the lift, I read an article that was put out by the vice president of Rotary Lift, the company that manufactures the lift that we're talking about installing. It's the, the article's titled, Don't Panic at Having to Replace In-Ground Lifts. And they're talking about the DEEP, EPA requirements on lifts. <clears throat> there's, there's no need to panic over the prospect of replacing in-ground lifts, nor EPA regulations that must be considered. The EPA reasoned hydraulic lifts, lift tanks pose a low level of risk compared to other types of storage tanks because they contain small amounts of non-hazardous regulated substance <coughs> used solely for the operational purposes of the lift. The EPA stated that losing fluid would so affect the operation of an in-ground lift that the operator would recognize its faulty operation. However, even though the EPA has excluded in-ground lift tanks from regulation, shop owners are still required to report oil spills, including those caused by leaks from in-ground lifts. So while it is true that lift has been in the ground for 50 plus years, and what you have is a cylinder that extends down into the ground eight or 10 feet, and it, it has hydraulic oil in it. So that vessel can corrode and can leak. The product that they're talking about purchasing has sealant applied around the outside of the steel casing which would help to minimize the corrosion and hopefully last longer. But if the, if the lift leaks, it's not going to operate, or it's going to operate erratically. I did ask the question if it was losing fluid. The answer was no, it's not losing fluid. So let's go back to the OSHA safety issue. That's a valid point. The lift controls are in the wrong place. They're too close to the electrical panel. It's a violation. Let's try and think out of the box a little bit. Let's move the controls. It's plumbing, it's pipes. There's, air, there's an air supply and there's a hydraulic supply, up and down control. You get a plumber in there and you move the pipes away from the electrical panel. You're not talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that. We even have plumbers in our own employ. I think we need to start looking at trying to save some money here. Everything is just, let's buy something new, let's approve this, let's approve that. I mean, this I realize it's going to get approved, otherwise we wouldn't be having the meeting here tonight. It's just going to get passed to the next meeting, everybody's going to vote yes, and we're out $170,000. And what are we really saving? Two people stood right up here and said that 95% of the work is being done now without the lift. They can't pick up a big fire truck, even with the, the lift they have. How much did, it, did they spend in the last year, or even two, three years going back, how much money did they spend subbing out the work? I don't think there was much at all. It, the question was asked a year and a half ago, we never got the answer. The question was asked again tonight, we still don't have the answer. If you're talking about saving $20,000, just pay the $20,000, relocate the controls, continue to use the existing lift, and, and we save that, that kind of money. You're talking about efficiencies. They're getting it done. The roads get plowed 
Wethersfield probably has the best road system in the state. I mean, people are calling up when there's snow flurries on the road and saying, when's my street going to get plowed? <laughs> I mean, it's a fantastic service. The leaves get picked up. They have to deal with all kinds of weather situations. It still gets done. Yes, trucks break down, trucks get fixed. That's why we have mechanics. I just think we need to start looking at ways to save money. It's, you can't keep spending money at the rate that you're spending it. We're just, we just spent a half a million dollars to protect salt, a salt shed. Can you imagine how much the town spent to put the existing salt shed up? <laughs> it's probably done on a weekend. And it's in deplorable condition, and it probably lasted 50 years. I think we need to start coming up with different solutions than just spending money. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mazzarello. We didn't pay for the salt shed yet, though. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anybody else in the audience who'd like to speak tonight? Okay, seeing none, do I have a motion to go into executive session to discuss personnel matters? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. That's the seat of power.